Welcome to NAPE web, webinar series, May edition. It's good to have everybody here. Um, for those of you trying to get on Instagram, um, we have some issues on Instagram, but every other thing is working. We are streaming live on YouTube. We are streaming live on Facebook. Um, thank you very much. Um, again, good evening. My name is Latif, Abdul Latif Amodu. And um, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today, to be your host for the entire event. I'm the Publicity Secretary for the Nigerian Association of Petroleum Explorationists, NAPE. And it's a pleasure to have our special guest speaker, Dr. Osnaburu, today who will be taking us through the topic, the new normal. Um, everybody's aware of what's going on out there as regards the COVID pandemic. And that's um, essentially what we'll be talking about. Um, so without much ado, I'll be sharing what the agenda for the day will be. It's pretty easy and straightforward. I'll be introducing our president-elect who introduce the guest speaker and give us a little context. And after that, we'll um, go through the main presentation for the day and the discussion where um, our guest speaker will walk us through a set of slides, about five to eight slides. And immediately after that, it should take about 15 minutes. Then we'll start to take question and answers live, essentially the same way we did it the last time. So without, um, Belaboring it, let me introduce the president elect who will be um, giving our welcome re uh, remarks and introducing the guest speaker for today. So let's have the president elect. Okay. My president elect, are you there? Please add um, the pre president elect. Can you hear me, Madam President elect? Okay. All right. Okay. Good, after All good right. evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Loud can and you clear. hear me? All right. Loud and clear. Loud and clear. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you all so much for uh, tuning on to today's uh, webinar. Uh, it's uh, the second in our NAPE uh, webinar series, uh, where since uh, COVID-19 uh, and all the attendant disruptions, we have decided to be um, uh, having these discussions. Uh, thank you all very much for tuning in. The last time I checked, we we're almost 200 people on the, on the bridge. Uh, that is great. Uh, we welcome you all very well. Uh, I know that uh, in this uh, webinar today, we would have uh, NAPE members, you're very welcome. Also, uh, the industry professionals uh, who are interested in NAPE, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, the business community, uh, the educational sector, uh, the regulators, and the general public, I say welcome. Uh, like I said, this is the second in our series. And guess what? The third in the series is loading. So just... Uh, Keep, uh, keep an eye out for our notifications. That will happen uh, in June, on the 10th of June. Um, today, we are looking at the topic, the new normal post-COVID-19 uh, and the implications for the oil and gas sector in Nigeria. I uh, must uh, confess that uh, this topic is actually very topical right now because of everything that is going on around us. And uh, they say that uh, information is power. And uh, we are so pleased to have a very 
well-informed and powerful speaker in our midst today. Uh, please join me to give a warm welcome to Dr. Augustine Ojuneku Avuru. Uh, he is a veteran of the oil industry, well over 40 years. I have actually known him for 36 years of those years. Uh, Augustine, you're welcome. Uh, right now, he's uh, the CEO and co-founder of Seplat, Seplat um, um, Oil and Gas Company. And he's been in this role since 2010. Before then, he co-found, he established uh, and managed the platform Petroleum Limited uh, from 2002. And before then, he was uh, um, exploration and technical manager in uh, Allied Energy. Before then, he was one of the top geoscientists uh, in uh, NMPC, where his work actually uh, uh, spanned both geoscience and reservoir engineering. Along the way, he took a very keen interest in the Nigerian content and championed the development of that sector. In fact, he chaired the policy drafting subcommittee of uh, what became the National Contact Act of uh, 2010. He is a proud alumnus of uh, United University of Nigeria, Unsuka. I, I please join me to welcome Augustine Ojuneku Avuru. Thank you. Okay. Wow. Thank you very much, B. Okay, we're trying to get um, Austin online. Okay, let's see. Wow, okay. All right, so we have um, Austin on Instagram. I'm trying to get him on Zoom. Okay, so good. I think we've gotten it now. Okay, excellent. All right. <clears throat> good day, good day, Chief. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, with, with all the hurdles, technological hurdles, um, data, internet, connectivity, all hurdles, we are here. Welcome yes. to. Um, NAPE webinar series. It's a pleasure to have you here, sir. Um, we, are, we are very, very happy to have you and uh, we can't wait to hear from you. Now, we have a very packed day and so that everybody's aware of what the rules are. So um, the plan is that we are going to listen to you for about 15 minutes while you walk through your slides and then we'll, it will now become the proper webinar where it is live and we'll start to take questions and answers. Um, for anybody that's interested in asking a question, please, um, we're not taking questions verbally. Sending your questions via the chat, whether it's uh, through YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or Zoom. Your name, location, company or affiliation, and then your question. And then we'll read that out. We have a couple of people behind the scenes collecting and collating all of that. So without much ado, I hand over to our special guest, um, who is also a DOT member, a board of trustees for the Nigerian Association of Petroleum Expressionists, the Chief Executive Officer of CEPLA. Austin, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure, always my pleasure, to have to participate in a NAPE event. Um, being myself a fellow of NAPE and past president. Uh, so in the next 15 minutes, maximum 20 minutes, I'll walk you through
Yeah. Okay. So you'll be uh, you'll be walking the um, the view grass from your studio while I, I talk through it. Okay. Um, so, so, so yeah. Go on with the first slide, please. Okay. So we have um, we have seen price shocks before, price shocks and rebounds. Um, those of us who have been here for quite a while, we have seen these price shocks in the 80s. You remember the 1985, 86 price shock? Um, and then you remember even the recent one uh, in 2016 when prices in February came as low as $26 before they rebound. However, this is different. Uh, go on to the next page, please. This is different because this time around, we have a combination of a supply shock with unprecedented demand drop and a global economic meltdown. So usually what we have is that when we have a supply glut for some reason, but more importantly, any shortfall in demand, then it affects the prices. But this time, because there was a global pandemic that led to a global economic meltdown, some 25 million barrels per day of demand was cut out at a time when the struggle for market share between the shale producers in the US on one hand and Russia and Saudi Arabia on the other hand led to supply shock. So we had an unprecedented case where prices actually went into negative at some point, even though for a few hours in one day. So, so, so this time it is different. And, and, and that's why we're looking at what the full impact will be even after this pandemic. Again, this time, the structural and financial health of our oil and gas sector today globally is also different. And I will go into a little bit of details there. Now let's see, between 1990 and 2005, we had growing demand. Growing demand, we came from about 76, um, about 76 million barrels a day um, up to about 95 million barrels a day by 2005. So that growing demand was the lowering costs uh, led to sustainably high prices over that period. And so oil and gas companies posted a total shareholder return. That's what I mean by TSR. A total shareholder return over this period that was higher than what the S&P 500 index uh, was, 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 was posting. And so what happened therefore was it attracted a lot of investment into oil and gas companies. Then between 2005 and 2020, demand had grown to about 105 million barrels a day. And because demand had grown, high cost producers came into the play to meet the demand and the high prices that had resulted. What had then happened was that between 2005 and 2020, we're beginning to see high cost oil coming in to meet the demand. So shale oil came in, in the past five years, Shale oil has introduced on 7.7 .7 million barrels per, per day. So supply increased and therefore price buckled. And over this period, the total shareholder return was 7% lower than S&P index. And so this leads to what I'm talking about, the structural and financial health of the sector. Today, therefore, investments in the oil and gas sector are drying up. So when you add all of these structural problems with the issues of, uh, of um, of uh, renewables, you'll find out that the oil and gas sector is not a major attraction for investments anymore. So when you put all of these um, together, what we're then seeing is that it is difficult to predict any long-term high prices. That is really the summary. High crude oil prices in the long term are difficult to predict. So now with all of these supplies that have come in, what happens is when price goes say below $35 per barrel, some of the high cost oil is taken out like shale oil, but it is available at a trigger price. So once oil price goes, uh, go to the next page. Once oil price goes between 30 and $40 and gets into the $45 range, you can very easily tune up the, the supply because it's available. The high cost oil can come back in. And so this demand supply balance uh, is such that we are not likely to see high oil prices the way we used to know them in the long term. Uh, in fact, the Ford costs today are hanging between $45 and $55. Uh, we won't see $45, $55 oil, according to today's Ford costs, until about 2022, 2023. 
and also even the LNG space. Uh, the fact that shale gas and uh, the U.S. now becoming a net exporter of, uh, of, of, of gas uh, means that LPG prices, uh, sorry, uh, LNG prices are also unlikely to go much higher than two to three dollars on top of Henry Hub. So that's 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 a fairly um, gloomy picture for the industry. Summary of what I'm saying is that we are going to see lower prices for much longer. That's that's really the summary. Now let's okay. come to the economy. Uh, the Nigerian economy, so that we eventually we can discuss how all of this will impact this economy. I've taken some real data. In 2019, the target tax collection, overall tax collection by federal tax authorities, was 8.8 .8 trillion, uh, trillion naira. The actual collection was 5.26 trillion naira. The oil revenue target out of this expected collection was 4.3 trillion, which would have been just about 50%. Um, of the target collection. The actual collection, oil revenue, was 2.11, half of what was projected. So again, if you look at the oil revenue as a, what was actually collected, as a percentage of what was uh, uh, the total tax collected, it's 40%. If you take it as a percentage of what was projected, it's 24%. Just, just, just take note of those figures and we'll talk about it in just a minute. Okay. And then the federal budget. Look at the federal budget. The approved revenue target for the federal budget for 2019 was 6.998, about 7 trillion naira. The actual collection was 4.6 trillion. The target revenue from oil for the federal budget was 3.688. The actual was 1.868. Again, the oil revenue as the percentage of the of uh, the actual revenue collected as a percentage of the total revenue is 53%. If you take your revenue actual as a percentage of actual revenue, it's 40, 40, uh, 40%. And when you take it as a percentage of the target, again, it's 20, 27%. Uh, 2020 um, budget before it, uh, it was reversed, the target revenue, 8.4 trillion. All revenue, including what uh, they have now included, what they call uh, um, renewals and signature bonuses, if that happens. Uh, the, the target is 3.7%. Again, 44% of, of the target revenue is what we're saying. The Q1 actual collection is 46%. That is oil and gas collection, 46% of actual total. Now, what will all these figures tell us? They tell us that unlike what we used to know, remember the Noah Singh song, oil accounts for 80% of federal revenue and accounts for 92% of foreign exchange. Not, not this year. So not just this year, we're seeing a trend. 2019, whether it is projected or actual, we are now seeing all revenue as a percentage of federal budget falling below 50%. We are now in the 40 to 45% range. We are no longer in the position where all revenue constitutes over 70% of federally collected revenue or of the total tax revenue. That's the key message. And we'll come into and, and, and look at what implications of that will be. So that's, that's the direct impact on the economy today. So what are we seeing in terms of the reset? Because there will have to be a reset of both our economic indices as a country and our practices as an industry. So again, this is what I was saying. The oil and gas contribution to a tax collection and federal revenue is trending downwards. Unfortunately, in a particular case in Nigeria, we're in a high cost scenario, the lower prices, that's global. I've, I've explained why I think we see lower prices for longer. But while everyone else is trying to cut down costs to be able to play in the lower price regime, our costs in Nigeria keep going up. And what are the key factors? Some of the operators today, especially small size operators that don't have their own facilities, actually spend as much as anywhere from six to $15 per barrel evacuation cost alone. That is your pipeline, two or three, uh, regimes of pipeline and then terminal costs and everything. And then you put in security costs, you know, to look after your pipeline, look after your facilities. You put all of this together and uh, everybody who wants some extra money, I hear there's a bill in the National Assembly to increase the 1% charge to NDDC, increase it to 2%. Everybody who wants extra money will tax the oil industry. But look, any taxes, any increase in cost to this industry is born between 65 and 85% by the tax man. So as long as costs are going up, 
and prices are getting lower, tax revenues are going to stay low and overall revenue and contribution to the budget is going to stay low. That's the economic reality. So now uh, the industry is adjusting to long-term low prices and also energy transition. That's the, uh, the, uh, the energy transition is real. Uh, by 2030, 20, in the late 2020, 2030s, we'll start seeing a plateauing of, of oil demand. Uh, 2040, we we'll start seeing a plateauing of gas demand and more and more renewables will be coming in. So these are realities in the long term we're going to have to deal with. So from an economic point of view, as a nation, a kind of adjustment that must now be made will be to emphasize and increase our non-oil revenue. Now, this is a sing song that we've been talking about for the past 20, 30 years, about diversifying our economy. Now, as long as we spoke about it, but there was cheap, almost free, oil rental revenue contributing to 70% of our budget, we didn't have the, the courage or the, the, the political will to do anything. But this time, it is real. In 2020, with the current prices as we know them, the total oil contribution to our budget this year will probably be in the 25 to 30% range. So when oil revenue that is no longer available to all our, our budget, we will be forced, this time is not just about talking about it, we'll be forced to look for other practical sources of revenue. So non-oil revenue becomes key. We'll have to now pay attention to gas, not necessarily from a revenue point of view, but as an enabler for domestic energy security and as a catalyst for industrial growth. So when we, when we start seeing gas uh, uh, generating, when we start seeing gas generating 15 gigawatts of electricity and being responsible for all of our cement plants and heavy industries, contributing major revenues into the budget and, 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 and contributing to, uh, to, to employment generation, that's what gas will be doing to our economy, not just as, as a rental revenue the way we saw oil in the past 60 years. Now, midstream industry will have to, industries will have to come in for import substitution. So for instance, when we're able to, to refine half of our crude oil production and export half of that, half of the products, when we have satisfied all of the local, you know, local consumption, those are the kind of things that this economy will have to start emphasizing. Then of course, minerals, mining, agriculture, uh, will become additional uh, foreign exchange earners. So, so when I talk about the reset that must happen, it's not that not postulating now that this is what we should do. This is what must happen because the free, almost free oil revenue is no longer available. And, and therefore the new normal from an economic readjustment point of view are these things I've listed. Non-oil revenue, gas as an enabler, midstream industries, domestic midstream industries that will have to capture the regional market and then re-emphasis uh, on minerals, mining, and agriculture uh, as, as forex, foreign exchange, uh, foreign exchange earners. Next page, please. And um, now, what about industry? What will be the reset we are looking to see in the in the industry? Um, so to survive, the companies must now use this crisis to boldly reposition their portfolios and transform their operating models. Because, as I said, we are not going to see those high prices that will enable you to make money, whether your, your operating cost, whether your unity dollars or $40, you make money. Now, think about it. At $40 oil, after revenue, uh, sorry, after royalty if you're on land, that's $32. Net re effective revenue is $32. So if your cost is $30, you're already down because you have only $2 to tax. Only $2 that a tax man will get revenue from and you will get profit out of. So we need to start heading back below $15 overall unit technical cost, UTC of below $15, to ever hope to survive in the kind of price regime that we are trying to see. We have to diversify our portfolios now. Operators have to choose whether you want to do oil and gas, or oil and gas midstream, or oil and gas and some midstream um, you know, uh, manufacturing like refining. You have to now, we now have to start thinking about, and I'm talking particularly about independents who are here, they will be here. Uh, if, if, it's not, if it's not good enough for multinationals, they'll move somewhere else. But independence will have to be here. So we have to remodel our portfolios in such a way that even at those very low prices, we'll at least survive. <clears throat> We're going to have to see, start seeing basic niche players. Some people who are just niche players. I mean, ExxonMobil made a huge success of this. A small, shallow, offshore niche area 
in the past 55, 60 years. Uh, they developed it, they mastered it, easy for them. So we're going to be very careful about how, how wide our footprints are. Um, if, you're, if you're a niche player in some portion of the onshore, you probably will have to stay there, develop enough facilities to make you in the long term become a low cost producer to be able to survive. There will of course be consolidation. If these kind of prices go on for the long term, uh, there, there are some people with, uh, with, with very weak balance sheets that simply will not survive. The banks will come knocking and if they don't survive, if they're sensible enough, they have to initiate consolidation so that they can take whatever residual value they have out of their assets. And then, as I said, there will have to be regional market capture. So the refineries and petrochemical plants like Dangote have to target the entire region and target, target the entire West African region for sending in their products. Those of us who are even in the gas business should take advantage of the West African gas pipeline and hope to deliver the gas that will power the entire West Africa, some 200, 300 million copper extra outside of Nigeria uh, into, into that kind of sub-region. The same thing with LPG. So all of these regional markets, we have to now hope to capture them as part of our survival strategy. And then, of course, no matter how small you are, start keeping an eye on the energy transition opportunities. For instance, I'm sure there will be a time, especially where there's full deregulation of, of, of electricity tariffs, when it might be cheaper for people in, in Borno and, and Jigawa to actually get electricity through solar, might be cheaper for them than joining the grid and get electricity that is produced uh, using gas here in the South. So we'll keep an eye on those energy transition opportunities. So just to, 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 to say thank you for, for the discussion, I'm just saying two things. The economic landscape has to be reset in line with the new realities that oil revenue is trending downwards below 45% as a percentage of total federal revenue. And that because we are looking forward to almost a new normal of fairly low oil prices, somewhere between 40 and 50, once it gets to 60, you are lucky. All of our operations, all of our portfolios now have to transform into that new price scenario and can only be successful if we take advantage of some of this niche play in addition to being a long-term low-cost producer. Those are the real issues. That's how I see it. Um, not a fortune teller, but that's how I see the new normal becoming uh, here in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Wow. Okay. Thank you very much. So let's first stop sharing. Um, we have a ton of questions. And the way you've taken this is um, multidimensional. So uh, you essentially assess the oil and gas industry um, globally, the impact of the pandemic plus the crash in oil prices. And then you also assess um, the oil and gas industry um, locally in country. And finally, you now um, assess the impact as the mainstay for the Nigerian economy. So I guess those are the three buckets essentially we'll be playing around with as we yeah. proceed forward. So first and first, there are a lot of people out there who have stated that, um, okay, we're trying to get you back on um, Instagram now. Let's see whether we can make that happen. Okay. All right. You should see the request very soon. So there are a lot of people out there who are stating unequivocally that um, the issues and challenges in the oil and gas industry in Nigeria right now have just been um, amplified by the current situation. That the challenges and the issues have been amplified. That these issues and challenges have always existed. The issues around um, security of investment, the issues around um, inadequate infrastructure, for instance, for evacuating gas, the issues around um, a, a clear path for deep water gas, um, old physical and regulatory policies that are not competitive. What is your take? Do you really think um, that what we are seeing right now is literally beyond beyond the impact of COVID-19, but it's um, essentially a reflection of real weaknesses in the policy framework of that supports the oil and gas industry in Nigeria? Okay. Do you want me to take each question or you want to ask it? No, no let, 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 let's, let's, let's do that. Let's take each question. 
So yeah, you can go ahead and attend to this question, sir. Okay, okay. No, no, you are right. The issues have always been there, which is really the reason I chose to talk about a new normal. It's not because, as I said, it's not because low oil prices is the first time it's happening, no. But I'm saying that the difference this time is that that easy revenue, rental revenue that almost always funded our budget, irrespective of how badly we handle both our policies and the industry, that easy revenue is no longer there. That's what we're losing. So when that revenue is beginning to account for only 25 to 30% of your federal budget, you must have it to do a routine. So we no longer have the luxury of sitting back and only speaking about these problems and doing nothing. So for instance, for the past 20 years, we've been talking about deregulating the downstream. I will be spending $2.5 billion every year subsidizing the downstream. So you borrow $2.5 billion to fund your budget and you subsidize the downstream, you subsidize just PMS 2.5 billion. It was never sensible, but we could afford to do that because we had revenue to play with. Now you can, if you want it, you can't afford it. We'll be spending $2 billion every year subsidizing electricity tariff. And therefore you can't pay the gas producers to give uh, gas to, uh, to, to, to generating companies. Distribution companies don't make enough money to invest. And therefore for, for 10 years, we'll be hanging around 4,000 megawatts of electricity. We speak about it, we don't do anything. You can no longer afford it. So those things must go. That's what I'm speaking about, the new normal. The new reality is that we can no longer afford those luxuries because that revenue is no longer there. So, so, so this, as you said, has amplified our weaknesses, but more importantly, this situation has now told us that those weaknesses will lead to the death of our economy if we don't take the actions that we should have taken all along. Okay, so um, we're not here to preach doomsday or doomsday theory. I understand where you're coming from. Um, but I think even more importantly, what do you suggest is the actual way forward? Because I have, I have a ton of questions coming, but I want to make sure we get to the bottom. So yes, yes. that expose clear, severe, critical gaps, right? We, we have the PIB coming. Um, if everything we hear is accurate, in about a couple of months, two, three months, the PIB should be passed. Um, November last year, the deep water, deep offshore and inland basin um, PSC was amended, I think November, October, November last year, 2019. So currently there are changes to regulations and physical terms and policies. Now my question is, what are those real critical set of changes that we really need to, you know, bite the bullet and take right now to essentially encourage a competitive environment. Because at the end of the day, um, TSR was what you said. It's our shareholders return. It's about investment and return on investment. And currently, I don't think we are that competitive. So what are those real big gaps that need to be addressed right now? Again, again, so let me restate this clearly. Um, before now, again, because of the luxury of all the uh, revenues we get from oil and gas, whether or not we got our acts together, most legislative attempts were only introduced to get more revenue for government. That's all it was all about. Okay. Every time okay. they talk about the original PIB intention was, sorry, we're not making enough money from deep water, we must change it. Even the last uh, deep water PSC, that was just the intention. Uh, you wake up, as you can see these days, the new, the new um, uh, DPR regulations is all about more fines and more revenue basis. These have all been the intention. Just go and get more money for the oil and gas industry. Okay. But we don't have that. We don't have that luxury anymore. Our structural changes, our economic structure and regulatory structure must now Galvanize the industry. Galvanize the industry to bake a bigger cake and therefore government will make more money. But even more importantly, galvanize the industry to be an enabler in the bigger economic, economic issues. That's what I spoke about, about gas. So, so it's not just about passing PIB now so that we can have more revenue for government. It's about passing a PIB that recognizes these points that I've raised. The PIB that recognizes these new realities and therefore can stimulate the industry 
and bring the industry back to relevance and back to vibrancy. That's what we should be looking at. That's, that's how the management of the economy and the management of our industry going forward, that's how it should be if we're serious. Okay, so just to make sure I'm, I, I get you right, we sh the, the, the physical terms, the policies, and what, whichever policy that wants to be pushed forward needs to be aimed at driving value and not increasing revenue. Because invariably, by driving value, we will inadvertently increase revenue. All right, so you do both. So you, you drive value and therefore increase revenue and increase the impact of the industry on the bigger economy. Okay, so I have a question from Emmanuel. Emmanuel um, is calling from all the way from California. His question is around um, new technology. I'll read it out. So Nigerian oil and gas companies fully ready to adopt new digital technologies in capital project management to save costs. Are they ready for that? If so, which technologies are most needed for quick wins? That's from Emmanuel. Would you like to take that? Let, let's take, it will be more efficient okay. come up with about three questions in a row. I'll take three of them and then we'll take All right. So um, we have Enna Agbaro Oando, Lagos, Nigeria. So his, his question is, uh, do you know the percentage performance from other sections or sectors enabled us to direct for direct comparison? So other sectors of the, of the economy. All right. Okay, we have, okay, let me take another question from a different platform. Give me a second. All right, uh, Mr. Biodu Adesoya, um, FNAPE, um, he says the um, number of countries are becoming producers as well. And this further shrinks the ultimate market for refined product gas. Okay, that's a comment, not a question. All right. Um, Bilo, also Nigeria, what is the impact of upcoming explorationists as well as current oil companies? Sorry, uh, take that again. Impact of what? An uh, explorationist. Uh, it's, that, that's a very open-ended question. What's the impact of upcoming explorationists? I guess it's saying uh, new explorationists, exploration geologists, that impact in the industry. It's a very open-ended question. And then um, Shola Scott, what's the impact of this unprecedented situation on the PIB? upcoming service companies, and what technology sectors should focus to survive and distribute value. So invariably, how, how would they weather the storm that is ongoing right now? OK, um, let me start with the first one. We're ready for technology and what technology the Nigerian oil and gas industry is not different from the global oil and gas industry. It's a global industry. It doesn't matter how small a player you are. You are likely to be utilizing services of the same slumbages and highly buttons of this world. And even if you are using services of uh, local companies, they are either affiliated with these multinationals or have their own niche play. So technology application to the oil and gas industry is global. The same technology you find in industry embracing uh, in the US, in Europe, in the Middle East is what you're going to find here. And the industry has never been shy of technology. As a matter of fact, the industry has been a leader in the application of technology. I mean, we came from, from 2D seismic, all migrated 2D seismic until we had 3D and 4D. And, and we now do things like seismic acoustic computers in inversion and, and so on. So the industry has never been shy of any technology. Now we're dealing with big data and data analytics. That's what is coming into the industry. And the entire industry globally is embracing that. Data analytics is a new thing that helps you to take a look at all the things you have done and you have been doing if you have. If you have drilled, if you are old enough in an industry like, like Shell that probably has a thousand wells that are drilled, the way to analyze both the reservoir characteristics of all those thousand wells that will help you make predictions of what to do, those things are going to change because we're now able to do this big data analytics. So if you ask me, which key technology is coming into the industry in a big way, it will be data analytics. But, but, but overall, 
technology is global in our industry and is not different in Nigeria. Um, in performance of other sectors, very, very good question. So, so I mean, the question is, so if oil and gas is going from 70% to 45% of the, of the federal, federal revenue, so, so where are we going to see the increases? I said, no, 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 no sector. Now, once you expand the economy, if every other sector is expanding, revenue to government always comes from taxes one way or the other. So if you check the trend, company income tax is, is increasing, but is now a very large portion of federal revenue because as activities increase in the economy overall, it's not just about oil and gas, sell it and bring back the dollars. It's now about UBA making 200 billion, whatever it is, $200 million of profit and paying 30% tax. If he makes $600 million of, of profit, the CIT will be that much higher. The same thing with VAT. If the economy expands in such a way that consumption and services, those things are also expanded, then VAT collection will also expand. So the, to answer your question directly, the other sectors will be all the, all the tax, taxable areas that will benefit from an expansion in the overall economy, which is why I was emphasizing. So if gas is an enabler for, for, for enlarging the, the bigger economy, those other revenues will come from there. So if we're generating 15 gigawatts of electricity instead of 4,000 watts of electricity, that's bigger industry, bigger companies, bigger uh, uh, service companies, bigger electricity companies, and therefore bigger taxes to government. So okay. non-oil revenue, those are the other sectors that we have to make up for, for, for the decline in oil revenue. Um, the impact on the PIB, as I said, I hope we shall all now be reasonable. The PIB that is going to the National Assembly is being handled as if it's a secret that government has to just do it and send it to the National Assembly as if they're carrying on as if the industry should not be trusted. Let's pass a, if you pass a PIB that is targeted at just revenue and doesn't stimulate this economy, in five years, we'll see the results. We'll see them here. There'll be no further inflow of funds into, into this industry. And even our production will become way too down and our costs will go even much higher. I showed you the structural nature of our industry globally today. It is difficult to, you know, to attract funding into the industry today for the reasons that I gave. And therefore, if you ignore this and think that the only reason you are legislating is to, uh, is to increase your revenue and ignore the other factors, it will boomerang on us. So that's, 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 that's what I think we should take into account in this PIB. Service companies, of course, usually are the hardest hit. Uh, in a situation like this, because once these prices crash, operators, the first thing they cut is CapEx, and what CapEx is what goes to service companies. If you as an operator, you have a, a budget of a, a billion dollars and 700 million or 600 million dollars is CapEx, all of that 600 million dollars goes to service companies. You're, you know, through all your contracting process, they will render services to you. The other 300 million is OPEX, some of it are direct GNA and co. So once you cut CapEx, you are, you are hurting the service companies. They are the first to, 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 to hurt. Drilling companies are hurting. Service providers are hurting. Um, so that will be the impact. Again, such service companies have to uh, uh, you know, adopt approaches that enable them to just barely survive during periods like this. And then when it picks up, they also be able to come back into the industry, providing services at lower cost that able to survive. So one of the biggest problems for service companies, especially small ones, if you are heavily leveraged, it's always a problem. Once there's a crash in price, then your bankers are knocking, then you're in trouble. If you are not leveraged, you can always, you know, cut, your, cut down your size to the point where you can just manage to survive during the one year period or so and come back into business. But when you are heavily leveraged, uh, then it's a problem. Bankruptcy uh, will knock on the door. Okay. All right. So we have some questions there. Um, these ones are from Facebook. So the first one comes from Amadi Chukwe, Chuku Tuek. Apologies, Amadi. Um, how would all this affect the employment and em employability of individuals in the oil and gas industry? So that's Amadi. Then um, Promise Noel says, what's the worst case scenario of the new normal? To a common man on the street of Nigeria, if the parties involved fail to act now. And then um, Femi Esson from the US is saying, given the dwindling revenues in the oil and gas industry, how does the country find the much needed restructuring fund 
apologies, fund the much needed restructuring of the downstream sector of the economy. So let's take those three. Um, how does it affect employment? All of us today are still carrying on as if we have not been hit. So there hasn't been a general wave of disengagement of staff yet. I'm sure it will start very soon with service companies. If you have four rigs operating and none of them is working now, and each rig uh, has, a, has a crew of 200 people, you are not going to keep the uh, 1,200 people if your rigs are not working. So that's going to start almost instantly. The operators themselves will probably watch two, three, four quarters, and things don't improve, and it starts hitting the bottom line, you start downsizing. So the general trend, especially for operators, first is cut carpets, see how much OPEX yeah. you can cut. And then when it gets to the bone, you cut staff. So yes, it's going to happen. Um, staff, staff positions will be lost. Uh, em employment will be downsized, that's for sure. Worst case scenario for the uh, common man, that is it's a nightmare because if we don't this, do these things we're talking about, so you are dealing with a situation where revenue to government is cut by half. You are dealing with a situation where this country owes a lot of money. We are back to pre or passenger debt level, both external and internal. Our debt service ratio now is getting close to 40% of our total revenue, actual collected revenue. Now, so you, you are getting to a situation, even those figures I showed to you, you see that the actual government revenue collection is actually less than, than, than the uh, recurrent expenditure, which means where we are really now, you have to borrow to be able to pay salaries as a government. When you get into that position, even those who are employed by government will soon get back to, you remember the Shagari days where governments, especially state governments, will be owing seven months, nine months of salaries. They won't pay, no pensions paid. We're getting back there. And we've just spoken about unemployment as even those who are employed will lose their jobs and then no new employment. So a combination of poverty, national and local poverty, individual poverty, unemployment is a nightmare scenario for this, increase in crime, um, and, and name it. It's, it's a nightmare scenario that we, we, we just have to do something. Otherwise, as the saying goes, when the poor man is hungry, the rich man is awake. You can't close your eyes when the poor man is hungry because he will come after you. That's a nightmare scenario we get into. Right. Um, so, oh, you're not going yet. Go on. Fund the restructuring of the downstream. And that's the point. There is no fund required from government to restructure the downstream. It's to just change their policy and end the subsidy regime that has created no value for anybody, not even, not even for government, and stimulate investments into the sector from the private sector. And that's it. That's all they need to do. They don't need any extra funding for that. Okay. So um, let's start. Take, this is a very interesting question. Um, is this the right timing for the upcoming marginal field feed round? Sorry, what's the question again? That's, okay. So this is Dr. Briggs. Is asking, is this the timing of the upcoming marginal field round the best? The timing, is this the best time for that? Considering the global pandemic? That's his question. Michelle from Lagos, Daniel Michelle from Lagos, is it possible to see the impact of local refinery as the main market for the upstream sector? Could this also locally increase the oil price in Nigeria. What is your informed opinion should be the priority of NNPC as it responds to the new normal? That's um, Akiremi Michael. Sorry, the last, the, the last part of that question. Let me get it. Okay, so Akiremi Aki um, Michael is asking, with everything that is going on, what should the NNPC's what should NNPC's response be to what's going on right now, as regards the pandemic in response to the new normal? Okay. All right. Then let's take let's add one more to that. On a scale of one to ten, how effective has the gas master plan been in contributing to the economy since? Inception. Okay. <clears throat> Let me start with uh, the last one so I don't forget. 
<clears throat> one of the things I didn't show in the figure there, the 2019, 2020, 2019 um, actual collection, um, oil revenue, oil and gas revenue. There was a gas tax revenue in the tax collection of 15 billion naira. It is small, but the previous year it was only 2 billion naira, and the year before, gas tax didn't contribute at all to the, um, to the federal revenue. So we're beginning to see an expansion of the gas, domestic gas industry to the point where the tax deriving from what they're producing, uh, they're paying tax on it because they're making money, they're flaring all of it, they won't be paying tax on it. So that's going to gradually increase, that's gas tax. Um, and so, so when you talk about the effect of the gas master plan, uh, ordinarily is a fantastic plan the only disruption or the distortion that has hit it is that 70% of the consumption of the domestic gas that you had in that master plan was targeted at the electricity sector. And uh, when it was being drawn up, the electricity sector was supposed to have grown from 3,000 megawatts to 15,000 megawatts by now. Uh, but a combination of all kinds of implementation problems, the major one of which is the subsidy on electricity that has made it impossible to collect the right revenue to fund the entire chain. So that has meant that um, the electricity sector has not grown. And because it hasn't grown, it has stifled the growth of the domestic gas, gas market itself. But otherwise, as a plan, the master plan can still be implemented without even any changes if all the other sectors uh, are made to benefit optimally and, and, and the private sector is energized to drive this. So um, the, the impact will be not just about the gas taxes that you collect, I keep emphasizing, the real impact will be how it will enable the other sectors of the economy to pick up and contribute more to the, uh, to the federal revenue. Now, is it the right time for marginal fields? If it's a major bid round, I can say yes, wait until uh, the price is right. Marginal fields, there's no right time for marginal fields. The real reason for, again, this marginal field, I hope is not targeted at just being able to collect revenues. <laughs> That's a good luck to everybody. Those of us who participated in the 2003 uh, fields, even when we paid only $150,000 as a uh, as signature bonus, we'll see how many have uh, come to production out of the 24 fields, 17 years after. So if anybody thinks that this, the intention of this one is to collect uh, at, at hundreds of millions of dollars of signature bonuses, is in Nigerian banks that will suffer, we we'll borrow the money, the fields don't come on production, there will be no tax revenue, no royalty, the banks will go under, they won't come on production. So again, what is the intent? If the intent is to both develop local capacity or in, you know, build more on the local capacity that we have developed now, so that in the long term you have sufficient production from these tiny fields that ordinarily will not be on production, even if it's just the royalty revenue that goes to government, you would have, you would have succeeded. So my direct answer is there is no right or wrong time for imaginary field bid round, provided intentions are clear to develop local capacity and also pay attention to this tiny field that ordinarily the multinationals will never pay attention to. The impact of local refineries on offtake, you know, that's a, there's a key point you are raising there. <clears throat> because in the final analysis, when renewables start, renewables and, and electric cars and so on, start taking dominance in the major consuming markets of our crude oil in Europe, in Asia, and in North America, we are going to keep turning to the domestic and regional market for crude oil production. So if, if the regional market across West Africa, across parts of Africa, are still heavily dependent on crude oil and petroleum products, at a time Europe is talking about electric gas, we better do well to be ready to, make, to put our supplies into this regional market because we will not be able to compete in Europe anymore. So yes, we have to start paying attention to local refineries and the regional market as the ultimate market for crude oil production as we go along. So I agree with you, the impact of local refineries, so the refineries themselves should also be able to not just buy the crude from us and pay, they should also be efficient enough to be able to send their products to any part of the world and be able to sell and make money. So, and I mentioned it there as the regional market capture. It's important for both operators and, and midstream players. We need to first of all capture the regional market before we talk about uh, about the larger scale exports. Okay. Now, sorry, the last one. What should NMPC's response be? I don't know. I've said everything I need to say. I'm not going to speak for them. Um, I've said everything I need to say. I won't speak for NMPC. 
Okay. So there's something you just touched on, uh, the marginal field bid round. And the, the, the success of the marginal field bid round. Again, we are professionals and this is a professional session. We, we talk without sentiment. Right now, the aim is it's uh, a science that drives the business, right? And like you mentioned, there were 24 in the last round. How many of them are actually producing right now? How many of them have actually grown their portfolio right now? So the question is, what did we do wrong in the last one? And just to add to that, as we speak, it is now 13 years before we had an actual proper full-on feed round for oil blocks, a proper feed round. In fact, all the activities that have been driven in the last decade has been around um, divestment and um, a bit of M&A here and there. And from your perspective, um, how, how important is it to have regular bid rounds? And then what exactly went wrong with the last marginal field bid round? Um, because we need to learn from those gaps in the next one. Now, let's see. Let's see. Um, this is from um, Mr. Bioda Desoya. As you know, a number of countries are becoming producers of oil and gas. And this could further shrink the ultimate market for Dangote refinery, refined products, and or YP, gas supply to the West Africa sub-region. What then becomes the strategy so we don't start having glut in supply all over again. I guess he's referring to on a regional basis now. Okay. We have other questions. Give me a second. Let's take some questions from Zoom. Okay. Um, let's start from the bottom. Sorry. Wow. What are the pragmatic quick win steps to help lower production costs? If you had to provide um, advocacy to government, what, what would you say are the quick, quick steps, quick win steps to lower production? That's Demo Lalisa um, from France. Do you want me to add one more or that, that's enough? Okay, let, let, let me, the last bid round really is, is um, it's a real poster child. I, I, don't, I can't speak about what was wrong with the last bid round but for marginal fees, the 2003 exercise we probably can never replicate an exercise as thorough as that. The intention was to build, to aggregate Nigerian professionals into the upstream and give them a chance to, to perform. That's been the signature bonus was only $150,000. You can't try. I don't expect signature bonus in this bid round. I don't expect even the tiniest field to attract a signature bonus of less than $1 million. So that was done deliberately to aggregate Nigerian professionals and give them a chance to perform. And, and it succeeded. There are 10 fields out, out of 24 that are on production today. I, I remember, in fact, it's an article that Toya Kiyosho had published, I, I, I wrote, I think back in 2007, when I predicted that if eight of these fields are on production 10 years after, then the exercise is a success. That's where we are. That not only on production, some have gone ahead to build bigger, you know, uh, uh, bigger, bigger institutions. I mean, uh, uh, Niger Delta, the Pioneer Marginal Field Company, is now, you know, NDP, NDEMP, ND Western. Yeah. Um, you see what uh, what Asmit is doing, refinery and so on. I, I don't want to talk about supply because I'm involved with that. So it's been a huge. <laughs> so, so really, this bid round should build on that success. If we know, if we do it very very well, if we if we are very pragmatic and very scientific about it, we should be able to sit down and measure the successes that came out of the last one. What were the challenges? What are the problems? What led to non-performance where we found non-performance and try to plug those holes in this current bid round so that in the end, we build a very robust domestic operating capacity. Because in the end, let me tell you, in the end, when this basin becomes unattractive because of continuing low prices and difficulties in this basin, this region is going to count on us, the independent players, the indigenous players, to be able to supply the energy that we need. You can see it in gas. When it comes to domestic gas, where are the multinationals? They will do LNG to supply gas to their, to their own markets. They won't do domestic gas here. 
when it comes to the, the time when this when the, the currency of this business is in naira you are not going to see the multinationals we have to be here to do it so whatever you do to build that capacity and i mean build the capacity don't spoon feed anybody who doesn't know what he's doing build the capacity let people pay the right right you know royalties and taxes and so on and be efficient but we must build that capacity because we're going to need it when when these people are not around or when or when they bail <clears throat> or even in a war situation the other in the case of Glocks, especially, I, and I know what, so, so Dangote is building a 650,000 barrel refinery, and our total demand in Nigeria is about 400,000 uh, barrels. So are we going to end up, you know, uh, if several refineries springing up and they have products don't know where to send? That's why I'm emphasizing the regional markets. The regional markets. <clears throat> if Dangote, a con conglomeration of them, you see, pick some, let's, let's just pick four key West African uh, um, um, uh, demand centers. If you put a major receptacle for petroleum products in, in Accra and a pipeline to Kumasi, such that you can take your vessel, just supply the products into a depot in Accra and you pipe to Kumasi and it covers the country. If you do that in Ghana and Ivory Coast and Senegal and a few others, you are cornered in the West African market. And I, I, I don't see a refinery in Europe or, or North America that can compete with you in bringing products to the same place. So we need to deliberately capture the domestic market as the outlet for all the investments we're making in Nigeria, not just the Nigerian market. The same thing, I've said this, I said this to the, to the, to the chairman of Ghana, gas, uh, Ghana, Ghana National Gas Company. I said, you cannot be importing, you cannot be attempting to import LPG, LNG from Russia. So they will bring the LNG, they will build a regasification plant in Ghana, by the time you put the total cost of doing that and regasifying, the gas is coming to you at $10 per thousand. And I can put gas into the West African pipeline at $3 a year. If the transportation cost is only $2, you'll get the same gas at $5. So if we actually use the infrastructure that is already available, if you extend the West African gas pipeline to Senegal, I can, we can beat our chest here that nobody can compete with us. Go and bring the LPG, LNG. We'll drop prices from our own domestic gas here. And, and you can compete. So there's no way, if we know what we're doing, the domestic market is ours for the ticket, whether it's for petroleum products, whether it's for gas to power, whatever it is that we produce here, we can capture the domestic market and be able to compete against anybody anywhere in the world because of our nearness to that market. We're right in the middle of that market. Um, quick steps, quick wins, the lower production. The first headache is evacuation. So security of, of so whatever government does to, to build security and trust in the Niger Delta, and I keep saying this because they don't need to spend so much money. Uh, we've gone through this at IPPG. We ran, we ran all the numbers. We made a presentation to government just to show that just by keeping your words, just by doing a few little, little political things and keeping to your words and not spending too much money, and the inhabitants benefit from the activities of the industry, we can lower all of these security costs and evacuation costs. There is no reason why our total evacuation cost should be more than $3 per barrel. It's, going, it's heading towards $15. So that is the first one that we have to solve, problem we have to solve collectively between the operators and government in a realistic way, not by paying tokens, not by funding more JTF, not by more, more, more uh, um, uh, whatever, uh, stop uh, distance along the road. No, we have to be realistic to design, and we've done this in IPPG, we made this presentation to government. We can come up with a pro program that we more than, that we reduce the uh, evacuation cost by up to 60%. <clears throat> then of course, contracting. Contracting has to be much more efficient. Our inefficient contracting process uh, with our partners, when you have a contracting process that takes you two years, so much is added, is, is parted into the cost of that. Those two, since we're talking about quick wins and not all the, all the issues addressed, I would say those are two quick wins. We we'll address them, and then the rest of it is about we, the operators ourselves, uh, you know, collaborating among ourselves in such a way that we use the facilities that we have built effectively and we're not replicating the facilities all over the place as it is today because the pipelines are not trusted. Everybody is putting his own FSO and budget at $18 per barrel when we could all have been using the pipelines at $3 per barrel. We can continue this way. We'll get to a point to spend all of this money, putting all these alternatives, 
facilities in place. And when oil price drops to thirty to thirty dollars per barrel, all of us are out of work. Um, so, so those are the quick ways. So, so collaboration among us, the operators, collaboration between operators and government to reduce the evacuation costs, and then of course we all have to be more efficient. All right. So. Um... We have a ton of questions. Um, I don't even know where to start from. Now, the plan was to actually have a break, but I think what we'll do is we'll power through to the end because of the glitches we had at the very beginning, if that's okay by you. Is that okay by you, sir? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, you talked about gas, collaboration, the market in this region being essentially... Um, because of our position, we are uniquely positioned to take advantage of that market. But then the next question is this. Development, Development population, uh, primary um, indicators you use in determining what your price should be. And right now, the development of this sub-region is not um, the highest. So when we talk about gas, can this region actually afford the gas? Because apart from the significant hole in energy in Nigeria, where's the demand for all this gas? Knowing fully well that the Niger Delta is under explored. Um, we've only tapped, let's say, top um, 10,000, 12,000 feet of stratigraphy. We're not drilling extremely deep wells. We're doing about 8,000 to 12,500 it wells. So the question is this. If we do eventually get our act together, it looks like we will have a situation where we will have so much product. How do we develop, how do we get our products out and make it um, essentially the best products for the Africa sub region? Because I don't think the West African market can handle all these products. Then let me add some other questions. Um, so this is saying, will, okay. What are the pragmatic steps to transition Nigeria into a gas consumer? Okay, so it's almost a similar question. Now, this question is asking uh, from Precious. Is the federal government not supposed to reduce tax rates for oil and gas exploration due to these ongoing pandemic? Okay. And then, um, no, that's the comment. Okay, so let's let's have that then. I'll, we'll take a look at it. Then, um, first question. You know, just like in Nigeria, we'll tell you that we produce 4,000 um, megawatts of electricity. But that's not our potential consumption. If you add all the, the diesel generator, diesel generator uh, 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 component of it, we're probably consuming some 25,000 meg megawatts of electricity. And so that is true of almost all elements of consumption of energy in, in, the, sub, in, the, in, in Africa, in fact, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So the energy consumption is low because development is stunted. And development is stunted because the energy to drive it is also not there. So it's a vicious circle. Now, okay. I don't have the exact data, but I know today uh, Africa consumes just about 52% of the crude oil we produce. But it's projected that by 2035, Africa, unless there are some big discoveries are yet to come, Africa will become almost a net importer. That is, even at two or 3% growth rate, our consumption of crude oil, we get to a point where Indonesia got to, where they became a net importer. So, so I think that, on the other hand, rather than saying that the West African sub region um, is too small a market to absorb our production, I think that the bottled up consumption is enormous. And I keep saying, I mean, 600 million people in sub Saharan Africa do not have electricity. And this is supposed to be taken for granted that in 2020, everybody should have electricity. So if, if only 20% of this population gets electricity in the next 20 years, that the multiplier effect is huge. You need gas to drive this, you need solar to drive this. So the real point I'm making is, 
the way, this sub-regional market is not as small as you say. Even in Nigeria, we were expecting that by now, our consumption, remember for 30 years, we were doing 300, uh, 300 million scores of gas a day. That's all we were consuming. When the master plan came in and the electricity sector was picking up, we went rapidly in three years from 300 million scores a day to almost one BCF a day. Unfortunately, we have, we have stayed at one BCF a day, 900 million to one BCF a day since 2015, when the electricity sector has been crippled. So again, at our full potential, the domestic consumption of gas in Nigeria, even today at our full potential, should be about three BCF a day, about half of what your LNG capacity is. Now it comes to this whole, this whole thing about, you know, we're a gas country, uh, we have uh, 200 TCF discovered, some 700 TCF undiscovered. Look, we're geologists, this is nothing. Let's be very careful about the numbers we throw around. Even the 200 TCF we throw around, those are figures we just tell our junior staff to calculate when you drill a well, you pay more attention to the oil reserve because that's what you're going to develop. That's what you're going to raise money for. Put some figure in the gas and throw it into the, into the database. When you really are ready to develop the gas and you're trying to raise money, like some of us have done, we are supplying gas to a power plant. And you say, I'm supplying him 150 million scope of gas. I need to demonstrate that I have reserves to supply him 150 million scope of gas a day for 15 years. Therefore, my gas reserves will have to be audited, technical audit. When we really need to audit the reserves we have for gas because we are putting investments into it, that's when we know what our real reserves are. I don't want to put any numbers, but I don't think we have 200 TCF of gas today. That's the same figure I've been carrying for 20 years. Uh, you know, when we really start looking at the numbers. Second, everybody always makes it look like when we go out to explore, oh, the one that to explore for gas, don't bother about that, explore for oil. Is that how we explore? When we map a structure, do we know which structure is gas and which structure is oil? We drill the structure, we find oil and gas, and we leave the gas undeveloped. So this whole thing about, oh, we haven't even started looking for gas. Where else are we going to look for gas except when we're looking for oil? So <laughs> when we really, really build up the demand, domestic demand plus LNG taking eight BCF a day, we're going to struggle to find the reserves to meet this, uh, to meet this demand for, for, for the next 20, 30 years. And these contracts are 15 years, 20 years. So let's not overestimate what our gas reserves are until we actually start uh, start putting realistic figures, you know, real figures, auditable figures to these gas reserves. I don't believe these numbers are actually around. Um, pragmatic steps to trans uh, transform Nigeria into a gas consumer. I've, I've been talking about that all day, especially the power sector and heavy industries. Shouldn't the federal government reduce tax? So that is the that's the paradigm. Because on the one hand, you are saying reduce tax so that we can survive as well. But on the other hand. The federal government is telling you that with these low prices, we can't even fund our budget, which is what I just demonstrated. So uh, it will be unfair to ask federal government to further reduce their, their taxes from the revenue they'll get from you, when in fact that they're, they're crying that under this scenario that they should be the largest losers. So I, I, I don't think so. I think all of us should tighten our belts so that we'll eventually be all winners, both operators and government uh, revenue. And I, I don't think we should ask them to reduce tax at this point. We'll be asking too much. All right, so um, Larry is asking, how do you educate um, regulators, policymakers about the impact of your analysis and postulation? <laughs> <laughs> then um, we have a Tony Akiyosho. Outside of the electric, electricity market, which is severely challenged, where do you see the growth area for domestic gas markets? Ayo, also from Lagos, would the current situation force mergers and acquisitions in the Nigeria e and space? With the current situation, what's the last question? That question? With the current M and A's. With the current situation force M and A's, mergers and acquisitions. Okay. okay. Um, as for educating regulators, I don't know. And I don't know how to answer that. We'll do our best while speaking. <laughs> we do this every month in Nape. We have an annual conference. This is the only place, it's only in Nape and SP that I feel free to say what I want to say everywhere else I try not to go to. I don't like to be quoted. But if I'm quoted and crucified because I spoke at Nape, that's fair enough uh, with all my relationship with Nape. We can't do much more than that. 
<clears throat> those who are in government, they know. There's nothing I'm talking about that they do not know about. If you, I mean, someone like Dr. Tim Okon has worked for government for a long time. You go and see his presentations. He has all these facts. He has all this data. He has everything. He made a presentation at our last NAPI conference. You saw how fantastic he was. These things are not new to people who are making the policies. They have them. So don't think that what we're saying is something they do not know. Those, should, those who should know, they know. And they, they ought to do what they ought to do. Um, some gas outside um, outside power to your case, so it's heavy industries. Um, so outside power. Um, so some people are trying to build what they call industrial clusters. And industrial clusters are trying to attract uh, industries that are heavy on power and gas. So if you have ceramics, for instance, people doing ceramics here, which can be done here instead of importing all of these are made in China. These are heavy users of gas and power. If you have big textile companies, when Glisco, for instance, if they set up shop here in Nigeria, instead of bringing all those things that they came from other African countries. So some proper industrial clusters can begin to take sizable volumes. I mean, a major industrial cluster can easily take 100 million scope of gas. So if you put them all together, once you start seeing in the aggregates, you know, about half a BCF of gas a day into industrial clusters, it starts making sense in addition to what power takes. Um, m &As, in every anywhere else in the world, m and will be induced by what is happening now. But you know, the Nigerian situation is always different because our businesses are tied to ego. So even when you know that you are at a point where you are, you are gasping for, for breath, you will take any, any approach of m and you take it personal as if the person is insulting your integrity. So it should, so my answer is, it should trigger m and but will it do so? Maybe not. So instead of m and you see some surviving and some dying, rather than m and to save those who should have died. Unfortunately, that's how our Nigerian business sector and our business sense is, uh, that's how they go. All right, so um, the first question is this. From your perspective, the, the concept and the intent of growing Nigerian content is noble, and uh, is the right way to go. But from your assessment, how well has that entire policy been? How well executed? What is the performance of that entire policy? Then the next question is coming. Um, you talked about the need to reduce the contractive cycle, but this question is specifically saying, what are those things that you think that will really enable that? That's from uh, Dr. Durobuton. Next question is from Femi. All over the world, people are drilling deeper, much deeper in challenging and unfamiliar territory. We've not really started pushing those frontiers and barriers. So um, how do we encourage marginal food operators to invest in cost-effective research, knowing fully well that most don't invest in research at all? Then the follow-up question is, um, We've had an industry that is essentially 60 years plus old. We do not have um, a world-class education or academic institute of energy, petroleum, or oil and gas. How do we create that enabling environment that galvanizes the educational sector to support the industry? Okay, um, growing Nigerian content. First of all, let me say that we may not have done very well as usual in execution. Um, remember that this is not the first time Nigeria has attempted to grow Nigerian content. In 1972, this country came up with its uh, indigenization program and actually passed laws that uh, forced certain companies to cede majority interest to Nigerians. 90% of these Nigerians benefited by just carrying the briefcase, having the nominal 51% and making money as individuals, but uh, the, the foreign partners ran away with everything. So it's not our first attempt, it's just like when, when we talk about even this local content we're talking about, go back and check the 1969 Petroleum Act, it's there, the intention is there. So we've always been, it's always been something that we know we want to do. And a few success cases in other, other industries have shown that 
this country does not have a choice. Now, <clears throat> until Dangote started making cement, we thought only Blue Circle and God could make cement. But today, he's making cement, meeting domestic, between him and Boa, they have exceeded domestic consumption, they're exporting. We we'll never have thought, we're all here. We all grew up knowing elephant cement as the only one made you every other one, you bring it and bag in a papa here and come and sell. They call you a bag. We're now making cement. Very soon, we'll probably have all the tomato that we need. Look, in 19, let's, when we were in this industry in the 80s, you couldn't borrow for $5 million from a consortium of Nigerian banks to do business. Today, we have Nigerian banks with balance sheet sizes that can, can give out a billion dollars of loan as a consortium. So we really do not have a choice. We need to first understand that. At the end of the day, this economy will not grow unless we grow it and our efforts are supplemented by the efforts of multinationals that come to join us. It's not the other way around. There are multinationals who come and grow it for us. I can tell you that the amount of revenue that Shell has taken from here to develop Holland, if 10% of it went into the Niger Delta, it would be a different story entirely. So we really don't have a choice. Let's first agree with that. So no matter how badly we're even performing in the implementation, we have to keep emphasizing that policy until we get it right. So how well have we done? Not very well. But have we done better than if we didn't try at all? Much, much better. There's no question about that. But we can do a lot better. Um, why are we not drilling deeper? Why are we not? We'll, we'll get there. You see, uh, you know, I was describing when we had a stretch of, you know, uh, high prices which then necessitated expensive oil to come in, it's normally driven by such dynamics. So when prices stabilize for four years at $100, shale producers who were operating at $40 could come in. Deep water producers could come in. So again, once you get to a point where the, the, the price, the supply demand balance uh, forces people to go into some more exp you know, expensive exploration to look for more uh, new oil, we'll get there. But it is difficult to ask a business person who borrowed money to develop a field and run his numbers at dollars and the price today is, is maybe thirty dollars. It was twenty dollars uh, two weeks ago, and he asked him to drill deeper. So my answer is, it will come, not but not just as a research exercise. It will come when it is driven by uh, by commercial considerations. The question about this educational sector and educational institutions again, it's, it's the story of our country. Um, you know, when we thought we needed technology, we build federal universities of technology. Those schools now produce more people in uh, sociology and religion than technology. We build federal colleges of agriculture. Um, they probably produce more people reading history than we build colleges of education to train teachers for primary and secondary school. All of them have been converted into universities. We build technical colleges to produce our welders and technicians. All of them are now uh, either the killed or their degree awarding. This industry. This industry deliberately created PTI. When PTI was created, it wasn't for everybody to come in. It is operators in the industry that were supposed to nominate people to go there and be trained in the lower and middle level technical areas to come and support us. So by now, all of the welders across sub-Saharan Africa in the oil and gas industry should have been coming from PTI and a number of other. What did we do? We rushed and converted into Federal University of uh, whatever it is called, Federal University of Oil and Gas whatever that means. So again, I won't comment much more on our educational system. It requires a complete restructuring for us to know why we set up those institutions and what we want to get out of them and also provide the proper funding for them. The restructures we have today, that is the reason you can't even see, as you said, an industry that's 60 years old, we should by now have, you know, have the kind of manpower base in that industry that will be experts in almost every, all the areas across uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So that's a bigger question about how I run our educational system rather than just an oil and gas issue. All right. So we have some um, very um, left field questions. So this is um, Dr. Briggs again. Tesla is building batteries to run it 1 million miles. What will be the effects and opportunities with regards to the use of fuel in driving cars? and the long-time effect on our oil exports. So that's um, Dr. Briggs. Then um, Precious Ogureke is asking, why is that 
that why is there no technology analyst of oil and gas data records in Nigeria because of all the data that has been generated in the news media are totally false. Okay. Then we have um, a question from uh, Ms. Saka. What key measures can oil and gas professionals adopt in anticipation of the energy transition in the coming years? So all these questions essentially are just talking about um, clean energy solutions, how they impact our industry, um, how they probably shrink um, the energy um, demand and use of um, crude oil or gas. What are your take? So that's why I try to wrap all of that up. So let me talk, you know, because this, let me then give a general answer about this is the famous uh, question of energy transition. Yeah. So energy transition is real, but also let's work on some numbers. Now, the projection is that by 40, 20 years from now, um, as I said, Earlier, um, sorry, things okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Okay, okay. okay. So energy transition is real. Um, so if you watch, if you see the trends, the projection is that crude oil demand will plateau about 2030. Plateau. Before we talk about a gentle um, uh, decline. Gas demand will continue to rise until about the late 2030s before it will plateau. Coal will continue to decline. But between those three fossil fuels by 2040, we still account for 53% of the energy mix. So, because we always make it look like oil and gas and coal will go away overnight. What you are going to see increasingly is an energy mix that must consider the environmental factors but also produce affordable energy that the world needs. The world needs a certain quantum of affordable energy. We can't mess with that. So yes, Tesla is building batteries. By 2035, 2040, probably all the cars in Europe will be, will be, uh, will be running on uh, will be electric cars. So yes, they may take away, if all the cars are running on electric, uh, if all electric cars probably take away 9 million barrels of crude oil per day in demand account for all those battery vehicles. But again, by that same time in 2030, 2040, total crude oil demand, if we go at the pace of one, one to 2% per, per, per annum as we're going now, will already be 140 million barrels a day. So if you took out 9, 10 million barrels for electricity, there's still a lot of, there's still a lot of crude oil demand for other areas. So what you are seeing is this. Those who plan 20, 30 years ahead, to solve the global problems, we realize that at a certain point, crude oil and natural gas being finite resources, they will plateau and start a decline. Now, can you imagine what will happen if these resources start a decline while demand continues to increase at 3%? That's a magidon. That's a magidon. Then the world will not have the energy it needs. So the world is beginning to develop those non-fuel energies that we continue to substitute for the decline in the fossil fuels when the decline happens. But at any point in time, you are going to have a basket of energy sources from solar, nuclear, oil, gas, coal, that will make up these baskets. Now, issues of environment, issues of cost of production, and how it reaches the final consumer, those are the issues that will eventually determine what percentage of the entire uh, basket that each of these aggregates will contribute. Uh, and that's how it's going to be. But as I said earlier, for us here in this sub-region, at a time when electric cars are the only cars you're going to find in Europe, of course, where will all the, uh, all the fuel cars be? They will all be here in this region. And so first of all, we have to, we have to be able to supply this market <laughs> during that transition. And, and maybe by the time that transition is over, even our own production will start declining. So it's all about long-term planning. And, and, and my answer to you is, they will continue going forward from now to be a basket of energy sources. And even as an operator, you decide where in that spectrum of energy sources you want to play going forward. That's, that's the decision you have to make from your business planning point of view. Okay. So um, a couple of questions. So somehow you've actually a lot of things, uh, macroeconomics, 
the state of the nation, um, the state of oil and gas industry, um, the performance of um, Nigerian content or local content development, the performance, um, the need for increased infrastructure. So this is the first question. Right now, globally, economies are in pain. Different types of um, financial health issues globally. Almost every industry is affected. There are very few industries that are immune from what's going on right now. What's your take on palliatives and stimulus for the oil and gas industry? Secondly, what are your thoughts on how um, FIR, the Federal in, um, Internal Revenue Service, and CBN, uh, the Ministry of Finance, and other um, regulators, MDAs, who are in charge of collecting one or two or multiple taxes and levies from the industry? How do you expect that intervention to come into play? And then, um, apart from Medina, in the last couple a decade or so, there has not been anything of that scale lately. Um, a couple of months ago, no, this month, Train 7 was signed, at least the engineering, uh, procurement, and contracting of that EPC. So the question is this. What are the considerations for FID or executing MCPs, um, um, MCPs to secure new investments? New consideration, considering what's going on right now. So part of the new normal, because what we are doing clearly is not working so well. So what are those new considerations to encourage FID that we won't be pushing FIDs over 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? you know, and executing major capital projects. Okay. Let me start with this last question, because again, I keep saying, even the efforts of our own Nigerian entrepreneurs, those efforts are not given credit. You know, when Dangote started building his nine, maybe it's even $12 billion refinery complex, there was no fanfare about NFID. Nobody, nobody even paid attention to him. This whole FID of LNG Trans 7 that was we have all, you know, everybody is clapping all over the world. It's a smaller project than Dangote's refinery. We, as Seplat, we started building a $1 billion gas, gas project, <clears throat> took FID on that at a time nobody was bringing money to this country. It wasn't even in, in uh, I don't even think Tony Akio should publish it. Don't talk of anybody talking about it. <laughs> for, for the record, I'm, I'm not part and of it, that. And even, <laughs> and even during this financial crisis, it's not affected. The construction is ongoing. So let me tell you, let me re-emphasize. This economy is going to be built out ultimately by Nigerians, supported by multinationals who come to support us, not the other way around. So anyway, so considerations for FID, and I'm saying this just to then re-emphasize everything you are talking about. Our policies, our regulatory framework going forward should be targeted at first of all, emphasizing domestic investment. I'm not saying feeding anybody. Don't throw things open for people to just make money from rent. Support genuine domestic investment. That is your first winner. And then, your I need to jump in. I really need to jump in. And this is the reason why. Yes. The scale of investments we're talking about, and I'm, I'm very happy you put out some numbers there. Yes. It's phenomenal. Yes. The entire Nigerian budget, about $25 billion, $40 billion. $25 the scale, Twenty-five. The scale of projects we're talking about here, Egina, Egina is about 16, 17. So we need to understand that what you're talking about requires individuals who are interested in making profit. Fundamentally, it's a business. Now, where the money comes from, I'm not, I'm not, and, I'm, and again. Let, let, let me finish what I'm saying. Let me finish okay, what I'm saying. I, know, I know exactly what you're saying. But let me also tell you that a $1 billion investment in, in, in an industrial cluster that uses 100 million scope of gas 
and employs 100,000 people producing local fabric and ceramics, has a much as 10 times more impact on the Nigerian economy than Egina. Egina could be a $12 billion investment. But go and go and calculate the, the, the really important things. I mean, let's I don't want to go into all those semi-political discussions where it is cash coming and 90% of the cash goes out and very little is left here. That's why the oil industry, with all these billions of investment, that come from only between nine and eleven percent of our GDP. That's the real point we're making. So every time I'm talking about domestic, I, it's, I'm not underrating the value of foreign investments coming into the, the country. But I'm talking about revving up this economy. We're not talking about rental economy, where you come and build, develop one offshore field, and 90% of all the investment that came in will employ only 200 people, and the rest of it goes. There's nothing wrong with it, but I'm saying those are not the mega investments that will revolve this economy. So yes, okay. we need those things to come in. I said it earlier that we must, our PIB, our regulation, our regulatory and, and legal framework must be such that we create vibrancy in the system, not just about collecting money. I already said that. So that's what we need to do to encourage FID. There's no, I know two things. There's money being pumped into Tanzania, gas uh, gas uh, business, money being pumped into uh, 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 Guyana, and, and none was coming here until 27 of, uh, of, uh, of LNG. And the 27 would not have happened if, if it was a fresh a fresh LNG, it's because it's just an addition to LNG. Very, LNG. very true. Yeah, whether very, very true. Where, where are they today? So we must, our regulatory and, 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 and governance framework must be such that we, we reintroduce vibrancy and remain competitive, then FID can come in. But I'm saying, just so that I'm not misunderstood, over and above that, let's pay attention to domestic investments, domestic investments, because they go a long way in wrapping up the economy. Not, you know, not just about the oil, the oil and gas. That's why I'm giving you concrete, concrete examples of investments in this place that are unsung, but we contribute a lot more in, in terms of supporting the larger economy in Nigeria than these other ones that we clap and dance about once, uh, once they are announced. Well, Palit, let me tell you how unfortunate it is. There are two pieces of legislation ongoing as we speak. One of them is on palliatives. <clears throat> Started from the House of Reps, it will soon be passed. Palliatives, just like it was done in the UK to, uh, to, to support the rest of the economy. That bill specifically, the only industry that it excludes is oil and gas. As we speak, wow. both us in IPPG and OPTS, we've just sent a letter to them to say, do you know what you're doing? We are the hardest hit by this crisis. We are the major contributor to the economy. We are, we are the on both sides. But we are the ones specifically excluded. The second piece of legislation that is ongoing is to amend the law on NDDC to double the 1% we pay to them. They've been collecting 1% from us. Of our, I don't know what they do with it, other than that they built a, a big office in Yenagua and they give loans to some businesses. But because it's an easy means of making money, there's a piece of legislation doubling it. So that is the point I'm making. Everybody right. who's coming up with new legislation, the intention is to make more money out of our industry. I don't see any of them who are sat back to say, what do we do to stimulate the industry and not just make more money out of them? So we're talking about palliatives. Those who are going to ask for palliatives are giving palliatives to everybody except the oil and gas industry. They're looking for more money from you, unfortunately. That is the situation. Sorry, can you, um, your um, Instagram has gone off and a lot of people are like, where's Mr. Austin? Where's Mr. Avuru? Where's Mr. Avuru? All right. So, but, okay. Funding fatigue. All right. So, and I have, so, this is to everybody. Um, first and first, we are overwhelmed with the volume of questions. We're doing our best to sift through similar questions, but we'll have to wrap up in about five to ten minutes. Okay. And then um, Mr. Austin is joining. Okay. All right. So you're connected on Instagram. You'll be up in about ten seconds. So, um, before I interrupted your conversation, is it that a couple of questions? You want me to take those questions, or you? Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm sure we'll just take the last set of questions, right? Then we're all right. Okay. Well, how we will do this is this: um, we're actually meant to wrap up in about three minutes, but we extend by five to ten, so that you can get your closing remarks. And um, so the first question is: given the funding fatigue of Nigerian banks. 
where do you think Peter Spondy will come in the post-pandemic era? And the reason why this is a very important question is this. You and I know a lot of Nigerian banks were born. Born real bad. You know, um, a different, several reasons. First time, first time as um, inadequate experience in the industry and poor execution by the individuals that are trying to be loans. A myriad of things, regulations, policies, an unbelievable drop in global price. A lot of things happened, but they got bought. Right now, everybody's in pain. So which Nigerian bank would really be looking at the oil and gas industry, especially with the size of money we're talking about there? So that's the first question. Um, the next question is, give me a second. Uh, at the point of, okay, that's, um, I skipped that. Why is it that there's no advance? Okay, sorry. Uh, these questions are just, uh, they're too similar. So I don't want to ask a similar question. Okay. Okay. Do you see Nigerian independent oil and gas companies actively playing in diversified energy sectors like solar, offshore wind, and later decades to come? Okay. All right, Mr. Khan. Okay. Okay, so we're going to try not to make this political, but it's an important question. The PIB is being drafted to regulate the industry. Why are operators not involved in the drafting of the bill? I, I, I saw your smack. Then, um, okay, I think, I think we can close with that. <coughs> Let me, <coughs> excuse me, I'll close. Sorry. I jump back, you're right. Um, but you see, when I started the presentation, I talked about the structure, financial structure of our industry has changed. Banks globally are limiting their funding to oil and gas. It's no longer a yes. dark um, Quite a bunch of um, shale producers in the US you know, are filing for chapter seven and chapter 11. Yes. A lot of banks are losing billions of dollars that they put into shale oil. In Nigeria, there's still about $3 billion of outstanding debt to Nigerian banks in the upstream, mostly by independents. So you're right. I can tell you there's a lot of provisioning for oil and gas uh, uh, industry loans uh, <clears throat> from Nigerian banks. So it's a very dire situation. And <clears throat> you add that to the fact that I'm saying the structure of the industry going forward is not one that will attract bank debt globally. It's even worse uh, 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 in Nigeria. So, so it's a very valid question. So where is funding going to come from? Um, we may have to start restructuring our business in such a way that equity funding, <clears throat> cash flow from operations and retained earnings become a significant part of our funding sources for, for any going concern. Because um, <clears throat> other investments into the industry, <clears throat> sorry, I think I've spoken for two hours. I've never yes. spoken for this long since. I, I apologize. No, 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 not a problem. So other okay. sources of funding, bank debt and, and other investment vehicles, you know, bonds and so on, they are getting increasingly difficult to bring into the industry. However, there will still be bankable projects that even Nigerian banks will deal with. I mean, as we speak, we in Seplot are in the process of raising $350 million of bank debt for our gas project in Anno. And about 100 to $150 million of that will come from Nigerian banks. Even in the middle of this crisis, there is that much appetite um, because they think that that project, even with what we have, is bankable. So there will still be bankable project. If you develop a bankable project, in spite of this crisis, they will still come in. But overall, um, bank debt and ordinary investments into our industry is going to be increasingly difficult. That's, that's a statement of fact. 
Uh, Nigerian oil and gas industry and the energy transition. Well, I, I say to, to all companies, like I said, our business in the oil and gas industry is to supply our bit of the energy that the world needs. That's the reason why business. So we have to continue to look at how that energy transition evolves. And when it's evolving from oil and gas into any other area, we better pay attention. Otherwise, we'll be like Kodak, that uh, <laughs> nobody thought you could take photographs without the Kodak film. Uh, when, the, uh, when the Japanese started it with Sony cameras and so on, we thought they were joking until today, where every uh, mobile phone takes a photograph and Kodak went under. Um, these guys came out as Lenovo, but otherwise, in the beginning, they thought there could be no computer unless it's a mainframe idea. So it's going to be the same thing. If we're in the energy business, you must keep an eye on that transition. And I think some, not everyone, but some Nigerian companies will eventually evolve and play a part in the emerging uh, uh, a new energy, energy source, particularly solar in the north of Nigeria. Because if we get to a point where the electricity industry uh, is fully market driven, and it becomes profitable to actually install um, you know, solar energy sources in the north where there's abundance of sunlight and make money out of it. It is the same energy providers in the oil and gas that are likely to be investors in that kind of space. So yes, I think we'll get in there, maybe slowly, but we will, we will get in there. Why are the operators not involved in the PIB? Let, let me also tell you that there are a few things we must recognize. Both the industry and government who have not been fair to each other. So look at what happened in the so-called deep water PSC. Why did government just come up one day with the deep water PSC without even informing, let alone discussing with the industry? Because government, those who work in government believe, and maybe rightly so, that we came out with, with uh, uh, a deep water PSC at $18 oil and made provision that look, we are giving you all of these generous terms, 50% tax, uh, uh, ITC of 50%, royalty zero, I want that. We're giving you these generous terms because we want you to bring in your investments. But if you make discoveries that are worth the while and prices increase, please let's sit down again and discuss. And for 30 years, they didn't sit down to discuss. Oil price went to $100, came down, did everything. They didn't sit down to discuss. If you were the chief of staff or somebody sitting in government, you're going to say, these bastards have all they have done is to, 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 to cheat us for 30 years and take all the revenues that came from us. So from the background of that bitterness, that the industry deliberately refused to discuss with them when we were taking away wind for profits, they went ahead and prepared a PSC without consulting the industry. Now, is it the right thing to do? Maybe not. The jury is out there because if that PSC law does not attract investment, so be it. In the next three, four years, we'll know how good it is or how bad it is. But that is the background. So we, we ran an industry where there was mistrust between the industry and government. It's the same thing. They are looking at this PIB as a way of correcting what they think are anomalies in the existing laws that have enabled us to go away with, with windfall profits. Unfortunately, the indices have changed. As I just pointed out, we are now in a low oil price regime. We are now in a low investment regime. So all put, we have to take a step backwards and start asking ourselves, even if you don't involve the industry, at least have people knowledgeable enough to be able to model a, a piece of legislation that will revitalize the industry and create a bigger cake for more revenue for all. But if we do it from the background of this bitterness I've described, we'll come up with a law that doesn't serve, doesn't serve the industry any good, ultimately will not serve government any good. That would be my answer to that. Okay. So, so, so this is the final, it's not a question. It's um, essentially, at the end of the day, things are driven by vision. From where you sit, from where you stand, over 30 years, 35 years in the industry, different types of experiences, including experience in an NPC, experience in an IOC, experience in, as an independent operator, marginal field operator, now a larger field, now an integrated company. From your personal experience, what do you think the vision for the Nigerian oil and gas industry, what do you think it should be, the vision? Because currently, um, the mantra is um, increase production to about 3 million 
and then increase reserves to about 40 billion. That's essentially the mantra. But what do you think the vision should be for the oil and gas industry for the country? We, we have always said this, and let me repeat it as, as a closing comment, and thank you for that. The day our planners, and really, that is the only reason I told you that we choose this rather strange topic about the new normal, uh, even though uh, you know uh, low oil prices is not new, but I say it's a new normal, because the real point I want to make is this. The day our planners move our oil and gas resources away from being a rent revenue contributor to being an enabler for economic growth, that's they will get it right. So if you are planning this economy and you're saying you want this economy to grow from its current $500 billion economy to $1 trillion economy in 20 years, what will be the role of oil and gas? That's the question we should be asking. And not if we want to increase our revenue from 15 billion to 30 billion, how much production are we looking for? No. Once we start with the right question, if we want to double the size of this economy in 20 years, what will be the role of oil and gas? And the primary role will first of all be to secure domestic energy, domestic energy security, both in terms of petroleum products and all the derivatives, petrochemicals, name it, and then gas and all its uses from fertilizer <clears throat> and therefore agriculture into heavy industries. You know, uh, uh, once you define that, that the first thing <clears throat> is for industry to be an enabler and that this is the role it should play. Then the revenue that comes from it is added, uh, added icing on the cake. That would be, that would be the way I will approach it. So it will be a question of what role can this industry play in doubling the size of the Nigerian economy in 20 years, not how much more money as rent can this industry contribute to our federal budget. Once you get the question right, then, then the entire planning will be different. Well, what can I say? Uh, the boss. <laughs> two hours, uh, it don't even seem like, uh, it seems like you can go under two hours, but uh, we have a time commitment we need to honor. Um, we actually meant to finish this program about 10 minutes ago. At this point, the only thing I can say is um, thank you for your time. Hopefully, we will do this some more because uh, I believe there are a lot of other topics we can dive in in more detail. Having said that, I'm going to invite the president of NAPE, um, Mr. Alex Saka, to join us. Uh, I'm sure the competition is when I start getting online. And um, we'll be putting the closing remarks. Um, again, thank you, Mr. Austin Abu, for your time. And my pleasure. Thank you. thank you very much. All right, sir. My, um, Mr. President, we are on Zoom right now. Okay. Good evening, distinguished. Ladies and gentlemen, I call you distinguished for making time to be a part of the success of this event. We appreciate your participation. The second series of MAPE webinar series. This is the second edition Many more are lined up as we progress to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to sincerely appreciate, on behalf of NAPE executive and the entire membership of NAPE, the team led by the PE and our public secretary, with the entire publicity team that put up this event, industry professionals, members, business community, the general public academia, without your participation, the speaker wouldn't have had even more extension in time to speak. We appreciate your active participation and key questions that were raised. That's what we expected at this session. I 
want to specially thank our distinguished speaker for today. He was not actually properly introduced. He doubles as one of our Aret Adams Award winners, besides being a fellow, distinguished fellow of NAPI, and a past president, a key speaker at so many of our events. He's also a member of the NAPI Think Tank Committee. Listening to him, you will appreciate where we're coming from and why we had to pick him to handle this topic. In January, he was there for us when we discussed Magia's acquisition and other topical issues in preparation for the COVID-19 and the impact it was going to throw up. I want to appreciate Dr. for making time to be at this event. In spite of all the challenges and many events that require his attention at this moment. So we're very proud of you. We appreciate you in every area. Past and present contributions we will not be tired of calling upon you as we pro progress in the pieces of NAPE for the year. I want to specifically mention a key issue in the course of your discussion Combine global demands almost short, supply over supply. Economy totally broke down globally. We've never had it this tough. This discussion was meant to encourage our members. We have passed through this before. We get out of it if we agree to work together. This is one of the first in the industry having a multi platform conversation so that each and every participant will have the opportunity to be a part of this. The fellowship, the participation has been huge, it's global. We want to encourage our members to expect more by next month when we come back with another key topic and a speaker that will also attract what's on crowd. We are not going to give up. We are trying to explore. We are trying to take risks. The challenges of COVID-19 will not get us discouraged. We are going to forge ahead. That's why we move from physical contacts to webinar series. This will sustain our members till at that time we are able to come together once again. The speaker also mentioned that high price for crude oil prediction in the long term will be a little difficult. We need to mellow down with guesswork at this stage and face the challenges before us. We will overcome. We are going to engage government at very high levels. The think tank committee of NAPA is expected to meet with government at every level. We are afford to sit on the fence. We are going to be at the center of decision making to pass our suggestions across even if they won't be accepted. So we present them in such a way that the government won't have any choice than to reason with us. We are going to continue to advocate what will sustain the industry. Without oil and gas, bigger challenges we face out as a nation. Like I said in my last interview, oil and gas will not lose value in the near future. Let us not get discouraged. The pandemic is a temptation that will overcome. There's still hope for a better future for the Nigerian oil and gas. Once again, thank you for being a part of the success of this event. We look forward to seeing you again at similar events
Thank you and thank you. God bless. Good evening. All right, that's it. Um, good night, everybody. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. All right, good night, everybody, and have a great evening.